Welcome to our author series, sponsored by National Lewis University's Library. I'm Carol Cable, one of the librarians here at the Chicago campus. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the library's outreach committee for putting this all together, and especially Linda Lawton. We all appreciate, you can clap, we all appreciate her yummy baked goods. Thanks, Linda. I'm sorry those of you online can't share them with us. <laughs> Tonight we are highlighting the book, The Fluent Reader in Action. And joining us are Kristen Lems, the author, and Catherine Gallinati, who is featured in the book. Dr. Kristen Lems is professor in the ESL Bilingual Education Program here at National Lewis University and is co-director of the grant ESL STEM Success in Multilingual Districts. She pursued her twin interests in reading and ESL through a doctorate in reading and language from National College of Education and a master's degree in TESOL from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her doctoral dissertation on adult ESL oral reading fluency won a finalist award from the International Reading Association for Outstanding Dissertation of the Year. Dr. Lem spent two years as a Fulbright Scholar in Algeria doing in-service training of post-secondary EFL teachers and she wrote a book on ESL EFL methods for the Peace Corps. She has recently completed professional development of Chilean English teachers in Chile as an English language specialist with the U.S. Department of State. Prior to graduating from Nequa Valley High School in Naperville, Catherine Gillinetti has lived and attended schools in California, Arizona, New York, and Illinois. Kate earned a bachelor's degree in elementary education from North Central College in Naperville and began her teaching career as a teaching assistant in the Oswego School District. She was then hired to teach kindergarten at Creekside Elementary School in Plainfield until the 2010-2011 school year when she accepted a first grade teaching position at that school. For this year, this school year, Kate is teaching fourth grade. She is pursuing her curriculum and instruction MBA degree at National Lewis University. She met Kristen in 2007 while taking an ELL course, Reading in a New Language, Linguistic Considerations, taught by Professor Lems. While a student in Professor Lems' course, Catherine wrote the Harry Potter Literacy Lesson. And for those of you who are here in person this evening, the two books are for sale. And wait, it's $10 each, but here's the special for tonight. Two for $11, okay? So please join me in welcoming Kate and Kristen. Thank you so much. It's so nice to have you here. And um, we, we're really grateful to have those of you here in person. And those of you out there in, uh, in our live stream land, we're very happy to have you uh, tuning in as well. This, this semester, I happen to be teaching online, both of my classes online. So my students, hopefully, are, are seeing me maybe for the first time. And I wish it were mutual. But anyway, we'll meet someday. So we're very, very happy and pleased to be here tonight. I also have to tell you a little funny story. I've kind of got a little stand up here. I was in such a rush to get out the door and bring these books and look just right that I forgot my purse. And one thing that I discovered is that as soon as you forget your purse, you forget how to drive. <laughs> as soon as I knew I didn't have my insurance and I didn't have my driver's license, it's like I couldn't even stay in my lane. <laughs> I didn't know how to put my brake on. I was so sure I'd be stopped by a cop. 
so so here I am, purseless, and it means I didn't have a brush and everything else. But hopefully, I've got a mind. So we'll we'll hope for the best. So um, I wanted to thank uh, very much the Library Outreach Committee for doing this, and also the folks in the Advancement NLU Advancement, um, Rob Schroeder in particular, who is streaming this live for us. So thank you so much. So here is um, the presentation that we're giving tonight. And uh, you'll notice that there are two of us and three pictures up here. <laughs> Noreen Morrow is another teacher who was featured in the book. And uh, she was required to be in New York today for a family event and couldn't be with us. But she is also in Naperville School District 203, and she's featured in the book as well, in one of the two books as well. So, so. And thanks to the NLU Library Outreach Committee, and in particular, Linda Lawton. <laughs> Thank you. So these are the two books, The Fluent Reader in Action. There was a very famous book called The Fluent Reader by Tim Rosinski, and these followed up on The Fluent Reader, showing what good fluency instruction should look like in the classroom. So. I'm going to give you a little overview of the books first and a little bit about Tim Rosinski, who is my co-author. Tim Rosinski is kind of the fluency superstar. He's got a large number of books published about fluency. And he proposed that this book be done and invited me to join. These are the things that he does. He's at Kent State. He was an editor of The Reading Teacher. He's written a lot of books about fluency, and he also authors this scholastic series called Word Ladders, where you start with love and letter by letter you change it into hate, or you start with, you know, um, Eve and you turn it into Dawn, but just by changing one letter. They're very popular and a lot of fun. And he's in the International Reading Hall of Fame. I don't know the name of his dog, but I know he's very attached to his dog. <laughs> so, and I'm Kristen Lems, and as you can see from these book covers, I've been pretty involved with fluency myself. I, um, have contributed to five books on the subject of fluency. And the one that we're talking about tonight, the two that we're talking about tonight, are, are these two on Scholastic. But then I also have two more on Guilford. And the one up there in the upper right-hand corner was the first book that I uh, collaborated on about fluency. And then the new edition is just about to come out, and that's what the, the new cover looks like. And then this one, which is my reading text, which is used in our reading classes. And we talk a lot about fluency in English language learners, too. So those are, those are what they look like. That's my library. And this is the book that Tim and I co-authored together previously. And the new edition is just coming out. So, And we also collaborated with Cal uh, Camille Blackowitz, who is a reading professor emerita from National Lewis, who's been involved with a lot of important reading projects. And there's a picture of her. She was my doctoral dissertation chair, and she was the one who first got me going on the whole subject of fluency. So, yeah, there's the, <laughs> there's the banner for the new edition. OK, then there were three other or two other authors for these two books. Gay, Gay Fawcett is one, and Bob Ackland is another. Gay was a friend of Tim, and Bob was a friend of mine. And so there were four of us working on these two books. And our mission was to find and document cases of great fluency instruction. What are teachers doing that exemplifies great fluency instruction? It's especially important because we found that in many school districts around the country, they're unfortunately thinking that fluent reading is synonymous with faster reading. And that's not necessarily the case at all. It's much more complex than that. So we have two books full of best practices in fluency instruction. The goal is to highlight teachers who are doing excellent jobs teaching fluency and then breaking down what they do in each chapter. And each chapter has the same format. Here's what we've got. It begins with a lively introduction, some kind of hook or quote or something. We hope it's lively. Then research that relates to the specific technique that is in that particular chapter. Then a description of the setting where this fluency instruction takes place and the nature of the actual fluency activity. And then proof that there's been some kind of successful outcome. It might be quantitative that the kids started reading with more comprehension, or it might have been qualitative that kids were 
showing better attendance in an after-school program or showing more motivation to read on their own, any one of a number of things. And then we had ways that you could follow up so that other teachers could also do these. So we had reproducibles in almost every chapter. Reproducibles means something that you can just put on the copy machine and then you can pass it out and use with your students. So you, you teachers here, you've probably been using the term fluency in your schools and you probably have talked about what fluency is. Here's a nice succinct definition. What is fluency, you might ask? It's the idea of the ability to decode and simultaneously construct meaning from text. So at the same time you're recognizing the words in a text, you're also understanding what they mean. Sometimes fluency is considered sort of a bridge between reading individual words and then becoming a proficient silent reader. So it's kind of the bridge where it's not just reading individual words, but seeing how they fit into a sentence or into a paragraph. Usually fluency is assessed with some kind of oral reading technique where students are reading aloud. And usually fluence, fluency measurements take these three kinds of measures, rate or words per minute, and then accuracy, how many of the words are read correctly, and expression or prosody. This would include things like at the end of the sentence, if there's a period, does the child have a pause that indicates that they understand that one sentence ended and the other one is about to begin? Or if there are quotation marks, do they make clear that they understand that that's a direct quote of a character in the reading? So that's, uh, that's expression. I'm going to show you something that's probably too small for you to see the details of, but I think you'll still get the idea. This is pretty important research that's done right in Illinois um, by a guy named Ditkowski, and he's given me permission to show this. Here's the idea that for each grade, this is grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, students should be reading these number of words correct per minute if they are going to succeed on the reading portion of the ISAT, which is the Illinois State reading assessment that comes every year. So the idea is if they read in third grade, if in the fall they read 75 words correct per minute in their oral reading assessment, that means they're likely to they're they're likely to have a proficient grade on their ISAT reading test. And if they read 118 words correct per minute, we can be reasonably sure that they're going to meet or exceed the standards for the ISAT. So he took a whole bunch of two sets of data, the ISAT scores for kids in Illinois, grades three through eight, and the uh, scores that on their oral reading. And he discovered that these are kind of the cut points for students being likely to be able to do well on their ISAT. So it's kind of interesting. You, you could spend hours looking at this because um, there's so many fascinating aspects to it. I'll, I'll just show you two that I noticed. One is, maybe Kate, you could point to it. For the spring, for seventh grade, okay, we've got uh, over there on the right, it would be 152, 213, okay. And um, when you look at eighth grade spring and you look at those scores right below it, you see it's 140 and 228, so you kind of see that the, uh, the average score in the spring drops between seventh and eighth grade. And uh, I think you can only assume that's kind of eighth grade slump. You know, that kids are kind of coasting after a while, they're not really exerting as much energy. But another thing that you'll notice, which is fascinating, is that, um, let's look at the green scores for a second. Let's say a seventh grader is, um, in the spring, at proficient level, they're reading 152 words correct per minute in one minute with grade level text. They come back in the fall and that same score is 120. <laughs> so you can see that uh, the average score drops by about 30 points during the summer. And I think that we also all know what happens in the summer. Kids forget how to read, they forget to read, they're not interested, they're outdoors, and so you kind of have to climb your way back in the fall. 
So this is very interesting because it shows us that there really is a strong correlation between how the kids are doing in their oral reading and their fluency scores and how they do on a silent reading test for the state of Illinois, an important standardized test. So this is another really interesting aspect of fluency. There's a trade-off be between expressive oral reading and comprehension. You know, if you've ever read aloud to a kid at night, maybe you know, reading their favorite book to try to help them get to sleep, that you might be reading something in a very animated way, and the kid says, well, then what did the raccoon do? And you think, was I reading about a raccoon? I have no recollection of it. <laughs> because you can read expressively, but really not be following what you're, what you're reading and not understanding it. So it is possible with fluency to lose your comprehension when you gain expression. One of my students last semester said, and I thought it was so brilliant, she said, for some reason when I read aloud, I lose my comprehension. If I try to concentrate on my comprehension, I lose my expressive language. So you can't necessarily do well in both of those things when you're being tested for fluency. You might be expressive but not have comprehension, or you might have comprehension and not sound very expressive. So we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at fluency scores. They don't tell you everything. They just tell you some things. So she says, so I compensate by reading everything first and then reading it aloud to my students. Makes sense. Anyone had a situation like that where they need to re read it to yourself silently before you read something to your students? Okay, I see, see a couple hands and a couple heads nodding. Very common phenomenon. So here are the three components that go with best practices of fluency instruction. And one of them is that the students should have the opportunity to repeat the reading, go through the text more than once, more than twice. The second one is that they should have a model of what good fluency sounds like. And that's really important for English language learners because they won't necessarily know that from their language environment. They might need to learn it by hearing proficient speakers of English practicing reading. And then the third one is that there should be some kind of progress monitoring so that they can see their progress as they, as they practice fluency. I hope this is on your handout so you can, if you don't have uh, a, a pencil or pen with you, you can at least follow the handout. So those are the three components that basically all of the different chapters in these two books contained. So here is a list of some of the best practices that we have in fluency instruction. And we're going to hear about one of them in a moment from Kate. Repeated reading is really great, where they practice reading aloud or silently the same passage. Reader's theater is another one, and we'll hear more about that soon. Fluency centers. A lot of uh, schools, including some high schools, do have fluency centers where somebody can go and reread a passage silently. Sometimes they have these uh, pieces of pipe so that they can hear themselves kind of uh, exaggerated or magnified in their own ear. And then they can actually pace themselves and see how many words correct per minute they read on the passage. That's a lot of fun. Choral reading is another one. When kids are just chanting with the teacher, that's fluency practice too. Partner reading, when they're reading in pairs around the room, they can be taking turns by paragraphs. If any of those so far that I've listed are, are techniques that you use, let me see. Raise your hand. OK. Well, widespread. OK, another one is um, performing. Poetry performances. Um, and song performances, those are also fluency practice because they're taking a text and they're practicing it, repeating it, perfecting it, and performing it. So these are all great fluency techniques. Another one is joke of the day. And I believe I'm going to play you joke of the day. This, is, um, this was created by one of the adjuncts in my program, the ESL Bilingual Education Program at National Lewis. His name is Matt Granger. Hi, Matt, if you're out there. You rock. <laughs> He's a third grade teacher at Schaefer School in Villa Park. And I'd like you to just hear one example of his fluency project. This is called Joke of the Day. And he's got a podcast here. You can go and look it up. If you just Google uh, Matt Granger, Joke of the Day, it'll come up if that's too small to read. So what he does is he puts English language learners in pairs. 
and they choose and practice a joke of the day, and then they perform it into a recording, and then the recording gets uploaded, and it's a podcast. So you'll hear the structure of the joke of the day. Here's an example. So that's just an, one idea for fluency, a great fluency project. So here are the table of contents for the first book. This is the pre-K through four. Just to show you, there's something about preschool fluency, expressive reading and tutoring, how to use songs, first graders and parental involvement. This is just the table of contents. And Noreen, who can't be here tonight, has a second grade project called Read and Relax. It's a program she created years ago and it's uh, being used in Naperville in the entire school district now. It's really cool. Um, action research, there's a hotel bell strategy where they ding the bell together, um, and some other things. Here's a picture from Noreen's program, Read and Relax. The kids are just all over the classroom cuddling up with books that they've chosen, and that they, um, when she comes by, she sort of taps them on the shoulder as she walks by, and then they read out loud just as she goes by. And then when she's gone by, they just go back to reading silently. It's very nice, very nice program. And then there's Sue Park, who I did this chapter, so I, I, I like to highlight this. She did a fluency podcast of animal poetry using student art. And I'm going to just show you uh, what she did, if everything cooperates. And then there's some others. There's something about RTI and so on. And... Fluency Masterpiece Gallery. I know most of you here are high school teachers, so we will talk about fluency in high school. So let's, let's just look at Sue Park's Animal Poetry Project for a moment. She worked with the lowest kids in a third grade reading program. It's a Title I school. It was a week-long project that she did. First, she had them read animal poetry by Prolotsky and Silverstein. You know those poets. Really terrific. Really fun. And then she showed them what expressive reading would look like on a voice print. And you know, a lot of programs now, just a normal computer can show you what a voice print looks like. And she showed them how unexpressive reading looked, and it was just flat. And then you see that expressive reading, there's a lot more variation, more dynamic variation. So she had the kids practice reading with expression and without it, and they looked at their own voice prints here. And you can see this third grader looking at his voice print. And then she had them repeat it and record it. They, so they chose a poem, practiced it and recorded it, looked at their voice prints. Then they drew a drawing of the animal that was featured in the poem, and then they filled in the colors with Kid Picks Deluxe, which is um, an Apple program, I guess, that's actually in their computers. So she didn't use any real crayons or paints. <laughs> and then they recorded their poems in their computer lab with GarageBand. This is a, a Mac school. And then the, uh, Sue uploaded the poems and the art, and she notified the families. And this is all still up on the Internet, too. And I'm going to try to play this, and we'll hope it works. So here they are, we podcast. Here is Mrs. Park's Lafayette Leopard's Animal Poetry. And here's how it goes. Crunch, crunch, the gorilla stomps through the grass. Gurr, gurr, the gorilla is not afraid. The gorilla pounds its chest to scare enemies. 
So you could adapt that to older kids. You could have them illustrate a poem that they liked. It could be, you know, a different poem that's not a children's poem. Uh, there's a lot of them. Annabelle Lee is so dramatic. There's a lot of great Gothic poetry that, that kids could illustrate and then read, and you can put it up in a podcast. You can do free podcasting these days. It's not hard at all. And these kinds of projects are very motivating for students, very motivating. They'll work very hard for a performance. Then we've got uh, the second book, which is more relevant to the high school teachers here. This is grades five and up, and we do include high school projects in here. Um, one of the featured authors is, or featured teachers, is Tim Hart, who's in Chicago Public Schools. He has created something called Ravenswood Broadcast Company. He has his, I think it's sixth graders operating as news people. They go around um, the school and they do interviews with um, the people on the street. And then they also read from a text. They go to one of the news sites like ABC TV and they print out the text for the day and then they read it as um, you know broadcasters would and it really helps them practice their expressive reading. I'll show you a picture of Ravenswood Broadcasting Company here, RBC. These are the announcers. And um, it was very motivating. He videotapes them, then he puts those videotapes online. And the kids, every day, they read um, different texts from the news. They have sports, and then they have features, and then they have the day's news. So that's a, a terrific project being done right in Chicago. And then we have more social studies, read alouds for fifth graders. Patriotic Songs, Poems, and Readers Theater, Guided Oral Reading. And here comes Chapter 12. <laughs> and I think this will be a great point to have Kate come and tell us about her project. Okay. Good evening and thank you for attending tonight. I'm honored to be a part of such a great accomplishment. Many thanks go to Professor Kristen Lems for including my Harry Potter lesson. This is my second time presenting at National Lewis um, on the subject. Like many other school districts, we have numerous student teachers from the colleges and universities in the surrounding area. And so one day while I was at work, a, a student teacher approached me and said, oh my gosh, I saw your picture in the National Lewis Library, you're famous. And I was so like taken back and amazed of my minor celebrity status, I guess. So it was pretty funny. Um, again, thank you for attending tonight. I'm excited to share my lesson with you tonight. Well, there are many components to reading that fit into each other like puzzle pieces. Fluency is a piece of the reading puzzle and it can be linked with comprehension. Fluency is the ability to read smoothly as if you're in an active conversation as opposed to stop and go reading. This can influence a student's ability to comprehend because if he or she is spending too much energy decoding the words, um, that can result in not remembering the actual meaning of the text. 
Reader's Theater is a great way to practice fluency because of the repetitive reading. My lesson involves giving or guiding students to create their own scripts that are practiced multiple times. Using familiar text can greatly improve one's fluency. I wanted to be able to differentiate my lessons plan as much as I could. Um, I wanted each group to have their own individual scripts. I didn't want the group scripts to be exactly identical, especially if we were going to have multiple groups performing. I thought that that would be very boring, so I wanted to have some variety. Um, I was giving my students more of a creative license with their scripts. One quote um, that Timothy Rosinski said in the beginning of my chapter explains differentiation in a very clear and concise way. He wrote, stronger writers can rearrange a story into a lively script, while developing writers can participate by turning part of a narrative into dialogue form. Um, and I felt as though my lesson plan was targeted to be challenging for all levels of learners within the classroom by allowing the students um, who are stronger writers to use more descriptive, vivid language um, and rich dialogue, whereas the more developing writers had the story that was already written and turn what was a story into a dialogue or a conversation. So um, we begin the lesson on day one, and I actually taught this to a sixth grade class, and we had block scheduling. So it took one week for us to complete. However, depending on your time frame, it might take two weeks um, if you weren't using the block scheduling. So like I said, um, this was a sixth grade class, and so we began by brainstorming a list of elements that make up a, a script or a play such as characters, setting, and expressive voice. And I wrote this on a chart to ref so that the students could refer to it throughout the week, and we put that in the classroom. And then I presented a uh, wordless picture book. The title of the book was Frog, Where Are You? And it's by Mercer Mayer. And she has many um, books that she has done in the series. Uh, there are actually no words, only pictures in the story. And I actually have a few pages from the, from the story. So as you can see in the beginning of the book, um, there is a boy and his dog. And they have, um, and I explained this all to my students. I showed them that the window's open, that the moon is out, the little boy's clothes are on the floor, and he's wearing his PJ and they're admiring their catch for the day. And then um, you can see the next slide, the uh, little boy is sleeping and the frog is coming out of the window. I'm sorry, they're a little out of order, but that's okay. Um, the frog's coming out of the jar while they're sleeping. And then the next picture, the, um, they wake up to find that their frog is missing and they're very upset about it. And so they're calling out the window for their frog. They want to know where he is. They're checking their shoes, checking out their whole room. And so the, basically the whole story is about the boy and the dog's adventure looking to see where the frog went. And um, so they do go and, and find a beehive, and they find a tree with a bunch of animals in it. Um, and eventually they find their way back to the pond, and that's where the frog is. So as a whole f group, we practice creating a script using the wordless picture book. So I modeled the first few pages, um, allowing the students to interact, of course. I talked my, to the students through um, my thought process. I discussed what I thought the boy might be saying. I discussed what maybe the, the dog would be saying or even thinking. Um, and I was also asking for students' input on what each character might be saying. So I was help guiding them along. Eventually, when I felt as though the students had enough um, experience with turning the script or turning the story into a dialogue I did have the students complete the rest of the story independently and I asked for them to bring it back the following the following day so that leads us into day two so the next day the students brought in their completed scripts on frog where are you but before we did anything with the scripts I wanted to go over um, dramatic reading so I actually made a t-chart and I split the t-chart into two different sides one side was um, good dramatic reading and the other side was bad dramatic reading and we brainstormed some characteristics about both sides and we recorded our responses on the t-chart so once we were done brainstorming I actually then handed out the story the tale of the three brothers which is a story within the story of of Harry Potter it's um basically what a wizard would consider a myth or a legend that's what the tale of the three brothers is so I modeled reading expressively and then I modeled um, using a monotone voice so then we added to the chart after I read it um, as needed and then I asked for volunteers to read their frog where are you scripts and so the class and I gave feedback on the students successes as well as any improvements that they may um, need to make
So now we're finally ready to turn our story into a script. So I gave, again, I gave each student a copy of the tale of the three brothers, and I split the classroom into four separate groups. And within those four groups, I actually split again into uh, pairs. So within the story, I split, I didn't want the students to have to try to create the um, script within the whole entire story. So each pair had the like one pair had the beginning another pair had the middle and another pair had the end so then they would put their scripts together um, they also had to come up with characters and assign them to each other while they were create, working on their projects so each pair took a part of the story and they broke it down into dialogue form and this is what made viewing each reader's theater exciting because each pair of students used their own ideas to change the story into a script versus me just handing them an already made script and everybody reads that already made script so I also do love how there's a writing component in this lesson um, because this can also greatly help uh, their fluency because it's a familiar text and they wrote it themselves. So they should be familiar with it. So then by day three, I, um, the, that, so day two that night, they gave me their scripts and I actually brought them home and typed them all up so that it would be easier for the students um, to read off of them when they did their play and for me to make copies so that they could have one. Um, I also provided the students with clear expectations of what I was going to be looking for during the presentation, such as well-defined characters, dialogue between the characters, and good narration. Um, I also wanted the story to parallel the original story. Uh, I didn't want the, st the students to stray too far from the original, because um, there were also time constraints too. Um, I also discussed students' volume, participation, the flow, the pacing, body language, and the familiarity with the text. That would include the students' fluency and accuracy, which is the main objective of the lesson. So then finally we reached day four, and this is actually where the heavy fluency instruction comes in. Um, this is the meat and potatoes. Uh, during this class, during day four, the students were just instructed to continue their repeated readings of the script to help improve the speed and accuracy of the students' reading as well as their expression. I also did remind the students to bring their costumes and um, props the next day, and I did stress the importance of a well-practiced script, so I told the students that they also needed to go home and practice their script. They needed to have read it enough. Um, and a lot of the, uh, that day, a lot of students were coming up to me and saying, oh my, oh my goodness, Ms. G, I have read this so many times, I think I'm done. And I would say, no, you know what, why don't you go back and read it a few more times? It's, this is what fluency is, so keep reading it. Um, then that way it will become familiar for them and easy to read. So then we're finally at day five. And um, the students were anxious when they came in. However, it was mixed feelings with motivation and excitement to perform. Um, some of the students actually got to school early that day and helped me set up for the audience. And some students also came in early that day to practice before class actually started because we were first period. Um, and we invited our friends, our peers, family, and administration to view our performance. I also decided to have the performance videotaped. Um, from equipment that I borrowed from the media center, both for fun and for as an assessment tool to be used for, with the students the following week. So the students performed and it went very well. Um, I think the students really enjoyed showing off all of their hard work throughout the week. Parents, administration, and friends were all very impressed too about how much dedication was put into each group's version of the tale of the three brothers. And so the next week, so that would be um, if I started on Monday, so the following Monday, I wanted the students to view the video um, to help with the reflection questions that they needed to fill out. So we previewed the questions, of course, before we um, filled it out, or before we watched the video. And so it was some examples of the questions were on a scale of one to 10, how comfortable were you with your part? Um, how would you describe your overall presentation? And what would you do differently? So we watched the video and the students filled out the reflection sheet. I also did notice too that a couple of days later some students who had never brought in Harry Potter books before were all of a sudden coming with Harry Potter books. So I felt very, um, I felt good that I had motivated students to gain an interest in Harry Potter and actually pick it up and see if they liked it. Um, and I did include some evidence of success. Um, like I said, it did spark an interest in Harry Potter. I did quote one of the students, and I spelled everything the way that she did, so I, it's um, verbatim. Um, she said, I did not know anything about the story because I do not read Harry Potter, but I think I will start reading it because it sounds very inspiring with lots of action. And that is true. <laughs> no shortage of, of action. 
Um, another question was, what did you like about your group's performance? And a student wrote, I love my group's performance. We didn't mess up at all. Our volume was good. Everything was awesome. Um, how comfortable were you with your part? The student wrote, I memorized all my lines because I read my lines like 15 times. Okay, and um, some thoughts of, on fluency these days. Well, there is research that shows a link between fluency and comprehension. And within a balanced literacy program, primary grades are introduced to fluency in shared reading and guided reading. Um, in the primary grades, because I have taught kindergarten and first grade, now I, I'm currently teaching fourth grade, but when I taught kindergarten and first grade, I would introduce the students to a, a story with in guided reading, and we would get very familiar with it, and then I would give them that book, and they would take it back to their seat and put it in what we call a book baggie. And so if they had a free moment, they would get out their book baggie books, their familiar reads, so I knew that they knew how to read them, and they would read them over and over to help with their fluency. But fluency instruction does become more important in the intermediate and middle grades. Um, lastly, some questions you have to ask yourself are, um, is fluency by itself a good measure for um, all ELL learners? Um, because we find, and me, myself being in fourth grade this year, I'm finding that some of my ELL learners actually may read slower to comprehend what they're reading because they might be translating. So um, no research has been done about this, and I know you and I had talked about that the last time that um, we spoke, and so we need some more research done about the correlation between fluency and ELL learners. So fluency is a piece of the reading puzzle, but it is not the, a pe not the entire picture. So thank you.